This is the third part of my talk. And here I'd like to give you practical tips that may help you with your classes, whether you're teaching literature or teaching writing. Uh, I want to talk to you about workshopping, the design of your online writing class. Um, I want to share some techniques that you may consider for your writing classes. I am sure by this time, many of you have gotten used to virtual teaching, but uh, let me share information from the University of Utah uh, that I found in the in, um, online. There is nothing particularly special about this information except that I found it and it seemed sensible. A writing teacher, and I believe she teaches college level classes, uh, Natalie Stillman Webb said, teaching online is not about hastily uploading files or constructing a correspondence course, but instead centers on designing and fostering a digital learning community. Over decades and across disciplines, researchers have found that online students' sense of social presence, their interaction with an instructor and classmates who they perceive as real people has been linked to student motivation satisfaction, retention, perceived learning, and critical thinking. The same, te same teacher said, we found that students most valued their instructor's feedback on their work followed by effective course organization. Students also pointed to peer review and discussions as important ways they learned with their peers. This same teacher noted, since we couldn't hold student presentations of their final projects in the physical classrooms as usual, I asked my students to create videos using Adobe Spark. She said, surprisingly, their projects were the strongest ever in my decade of teaching the course. The video format allowed students to more clearly organize and articulate their ideas. I found another site for primary writing, and the teachers talked of getting the students to draft pieces, engage in conferring, collaborate to mark up mentor texts, and publish their writing through online platforms. The art classes that I take are via Zoom. I'm taking art classes, as I mentioned to you. And in these classes, the teacher is able to show how he or she actually does a particular exercise. The one teacher uses colored pencil, the other uses graphite, and I am able to see them on the computer screen in action. They explain what they're doing, and actually I am probably able to observe their illustrations better than in a physical classroom. The downside is that they cannot always actually see the work of the students clearly. Sometimes Zoom presents fuzzy images. But the two teachers I have allow us to do in-class exercises. In the one class, the students share their in-class work at the end of the class. In the other, the teacher gives very mild critiquing, emphasizing what works and suggesting how the students can improve the work. On the last day of class, we even have a party wherein we bring our own food and drink um, and uh, we get to sketch what we have brought um, for that last day. The other art teacher has another kind of format, but what he has done is, because he spends a lot of time demonstrating, he has created a Facebook group page wherein his students, past and present, post their artworks or their homework. And in this site, students can comment on the work. And overall, the, the comments are very generous. What I'd like us to take away from these online classes are the students' need for feedback about their writing exercises from teachers and peers. And second, that the final works need to be celebrated in some way, perhaps by a video presentation or via publication on online platforms. I, I know of a writer's group also, and you can find them uh, in Facebook the, or online. The, it's an e-magazine, the Maginhawa Street Journal, wherein writers and artists post articles and art. 
this is a more sophisticated production with an editorial board, its own website, and so on. But I think um, to a literature teacher, it would be easy enough to, to open a Facebook group site that can allow students to post their writings and art as, as, as the teacher pleases. Now, I want to talk to share with you some tips about creative writing. Um, before I start, I want you to know that my book, I have a book entitled Fundamentals of Creative Writing, which I made available for free on Wattpad. Um, when the pandemic broke out, I wanted to um, do something to, to help out. And I thought that making this book free on Wattpad can help teachers and students. So this book describes the essentials of creative writing in a very straightforward, simple, very accessible way. It includes chapters about setting and scene, character, conflict, dialogue, plot, point of view, voice, style, theme, tone, and other topics. It's, it's very straightforward and it includes sample stories and some exercises that the teacher can just follow or use for the classroom. Teachers have been using it. Um, this came out in, uh, as an actual book, but, uh, and you may still be able to find it. Anvil was the publisher, but I found that many teachers are having difficulty getting it. And so this was one other reason I made it available in Wattpad so these teachers can continue using it. You are welcome to use it. So all you need to do is look for my name, Cecilia Brainard in Wattpad, W-A-T-T-P-A-D. Your students will be very familiar with Wattpad. I also want you to know that I have a travel blog, Travels and More with Cecilia Brainard on Blogspot that has many entries about writing, about uh, uh, not just traveling. The blog also features guest bloggers and their writings. And these writers are quite, some of them are quite well-known Filipino and Filipino American authors. Um, so this is a good way for your students to find poems or stories um, by our own writers. Look for travels and more with Cecilia Brainerd um, on Blogspot, blogger. So I want to share some teaching tips. Um, rather than repeating information that's in my fundamentals of creative writing, I'd like to share some other thoughts about teaching literature or writing. The first thing I want to emphasize is the notion of praise, P-R-A-I-S-E. For students who are beginning writers, the style of teaching that is most effective is to focus on the strengths of their writings. When I tell my students what works in their writings, they will produce more of that. If I harp on what is, uh, what is weak, it only kind of batters their ego and some of them then become afraid to write. I'm talking about the beginning writers. The weaknesses of their writings can be mentioned, but not in a critical way, but as questions or suggestions. Instead of saying, well, this dialogue doesn't work, one can say, why did this particular character say this? Or uh, why, did, why did this particular boy say the F word 50 times? And this is very popular among young writers to, be, to have characters that are always saying the F word. Is, is that F word, 50 F words really necessary and effective? What other way could a character say or do to express his or her anger? The homework, the work that is written at home that, that the student has edited and thought about is scrutinized more. And the level of critiquing depends on the level of the class. Of course, master classes with more experienced writers uh, can, 
the in that in that case the critiquing there's sometimes there's no holding back um the seasoned writer can generally take the critiquing still the comments should focus on details of what works what are the strengths and what doesn't work the weaknesses and there should be questions about the work and suggestions for beginning writing students though I may, because just because their egos are still very weak and they're not used to having their works critiqued, I may critique their works anonymously. In this case, the class does not know whose work I'm looking at, and I can point out the strengths and weaknesses with less fear that the writer will be crushed. It's very difficult to get your work critiqued and requires, it requires a strong spirit to take the feedback and a stronger spirit to reflect on the comments and rewrite the work. In writing classes, the students and I will read, aside from the student works, published stories, which illustrate poem, points I want to make. For instance, if we are focusing on dialogue, we will read a published story that has strong dialogue. We read and critique that story and discuss what, what works and what doesn't work. In this way, the students can pick up the nuances of good writing or bad writing. It is possible, depending on the class, that we will look at an entire novel or different novels. It depends on the class. And that novel can be our source for discussing the various elements of creative writing. There's another tip that I want to share with you, and that's the notion of using spontaneous writing in your class, in your class as, as a form of exercise. I like to have in-class writing exercises aside from homework. The in-class exercises loosen up the class. It allows students to flex their writing muscles. The products of these exercises are generally not critiqued heavily. The class may even applaud after the reading, and I will just simply thank the writer. And the reason for this is obvious. The work is raw. It's fresh from the creative mind. It has not been edited. It has not been thought over carefully by the writer. The praise given to the writer encourages him or her. In fact, Praise is highly important, not just for beginning writers, but for everyone. You see, creative writing is difficult enough. It's not just the struggle of getting words down, but it's the bearing of one's soul that makes the effort challenging. It is not easy to reveal what is close to our hearts, what could be secrets. This is the primary reason why beginning writers in particular should in a way be critiqued gently. They need praise, but they also need guidance and information about how to make their work better. So as teachers, this is our job to juggle with these, th with these two things. So in my workshops, I use prompts to get participants started. Uh, for instance, write for 10 minutes and your prompt is when I was 10 years old. And it's um, when I was blank years old. It is amazing how this prompt can open a floodgate of stories from everyone. So here are some other prompts. She studied her face in the mirror. I was afraid, really afraid. We came back every year to lay flowers at the spot. The other night I dreamt my favorite room was so the idea is you give the prompt and the students use that as the beginning of what they are writing. You can see that you can use just about any phrase as a prompt or sentence. Some teachers will pull one line from a book or Bible and use that as a prompt. You could even ask your students to write down topics that they want to write about and you can put that in a box and you can pull one out for class meeting. So here's another thing I wanted to just talk to you about. And it's the notion of what I call sensual writing. This is 
something useful for writing students. Um, and by sensual writing, I am referring to the five centers, senses of seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, and tasting. If the writer makes it a point to write in a sensual way, the scenes come alive and readers can experience the scene more vividly. In other words, they can imagine themselves, the readers can imagine themselves better uh, as to what, where the character is, what the character is doing, what the character is seeing, smelling, feeling, and so on. And it makes for more vibrant writing. So, and here's another thing that I want to talk to you about also. Um, it's the dugdungan, dugdungan writing. Um, I first heard about Dugdungan from the Sabuana writer, Lina Espina Moore, who had told me that uh, apparently the writers uh, um, during her time, uh, the young writers then, must have, this must have been 1930, used to write Dugdungan, Dugdungan stories. So the Dugdungan, D-U-G-D-U-N-G-A-N, is collaborative writing that is very creative and fun. It is something like the Renga, the Japanese linked verse poetry written by two or more poets. The writers write alternating sections of a poem for, in the Renga. Some years ago, um, I was in an online writing workshop with some writer friends and we wanted to do an experiment and we wrote a Dugdungan short story and we even wrote a novel. Uh, surprisingly, both were published. We had a very silly uh, story, the New Tricks, and it became part of an anthology published by Mil Flores. Um, so what happened was one writer would write one or two sentences, then pass the piece on to the next writer who added more lines and pass it on to the next and so on. And uh, in the end, one or two people then sort of edited the piece to, to make the whole thing coherent. The, the novel, the Dugdungan novel that we worked on was more elaborate because of the sheer length and complexity. From the start, we decided that we were going to write just a fun piece. We wanted to just uh, keep it low key. We call it chiclet. Let's just go ahead and write chiclet. So what happened then was one writer started a chapter and would pass it on to the next and the next writer would write the second chapter and so on. So I have to tell you that the end result was a mess. The voices of the five authors were apparent, meaning the writing style was just not smooth. And um, we submitted it to a publisher who said the same thing. So we had to look at it again and it took a lot of editing to make the work publishable. We had to kind of smooth it out and, and make it more coherent. Uh, the book is called Angelica's Daughter. It's, I believe it's out of print, but you can find it online published by Anvil. So this book actually received a very strong review. It received some strong reviews, including one from a German professor, Dr. Michaela Keck, who was very impressed with our process of writing as well as a product. At some point in time, I was in Frankfurt and we met and uh, we had a nice talk. And what I found very interesting was that she said she wished the Dugdunga novel had not been so smoothed out. She wanted less editing. So I, I thought that was very interesting. She wanted to be able to feel the five different voices in that novel. Well, it's true, you know, I have found that sometimes when I overwork my piece, my voice loses its punch, my writing voice. So this can happen with long pieces, such as a novel. When I write and rewrite and rewrite a draft, it almost becomes stale and I actually get tired of it. It's better for me, and actually it is suggested by many writers to other writers, to finish your draft, no matter how bad the writing is before the editing is done. So um, 
I just want to thank Professor uh, Christopher Yap Wright once again for inviting me and to thank all of you for your patience and listening to me. I wish you and your students the very best. You can find me in my official website, ceciliabrainard.com and in social media. Don't hesitate contacting me if you have questions. I, what I will also do is I will post a transcript of this talk in my blog, Travels and More, so that uh, you and your students can access it in case you missed parts of it. I'm going to conclude this talk. I want to thank you again. Goodbye for now. Salamat. <laughs>